Okay, we're good. Um, let me go ahead and screen share with you guys really quickly. Okay. This is our class, 1314, 233. Uh, again, yesterday we should have covered the orientation module. I know that we were rushing things along towards the end there. The main thing is that you wanted to be able to get into um, MyLabs Plus because that's the homework platform that we're going to be using throughout the semester. But once we get everything situated in the orientation module, don't worry so much about the due dates for the assignments in the orientation module. Those things should be done by the end of the week. Uh, but if you're really busy right now, you know, you don't have to put that extra stress on yourself. We'll get it taken care of. And if you're showing up to class, you're doing what you need to do. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this Q&A community discussion board. This is here if you have any questions uh, about the class or about content that we go over um, in lecture. And if you want to, you know, pose a question to your classmates, you can post it there or pose a question to me. I'll check that periodically and try to respond to anything that you guys post there. Um, but yeah, so I've created module one. I went ahead and published some of that material. This is what it looks like on your end of things. Um, I'll go ahead and close that. Uh, you should see an overview for module one uh, that just describes what we're going to be covering in this module. Remember, each of the modules is going to lead up to one of the tests for the semester. So module one will lead up to test one, which is primarily over linear equations. But before we get there, we need to start at the basics and talk about fractions because fractions are going to come up uh, left and right throughout this course. And if you are afraid of fractions and you prefer decimals, well, I got bad news for you. We got to get you comfortable with fractions. So you'll notice that there are some lecture notes here, uh, some additional PowerPoint slides that I've developed, and a handout on fraction arithmetic, that is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division rules for fractions. I'm going to talk about that over today and possibly uh, tomorrow. Um, and that will lead up to the homework assignments. After each class, I will go ahead and upload more content and put, you know, if I assign a homework in my, uh, my math lab, then it will appear at the bottom of module one. So keep checking back to see, you know, do I have a homework assignment? Uh, those things will also be posted as announcements in Canvas at the end of the week. Um, just as a, a courtesy reminder for what, what is due by the end of the week, okay? So let's go ahead and jump into, let's stop that share. Then we're gonna do some advanced sharing. Okay. Can you guys see what's on my screen? Yeah, this uh, white paper here. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about fractions, but at the top of this lecture, we really need to talk about numbers in general. Uh, and if at any point you cannot see clearly what I'm writing, just let me know and I can zoom in and out like so. But if I zoom too far in, you might not be able to see it. Okay, so the first thing that we need to talk about is fractions, but uh, we really need to understand how numbers work on the number lines. So, um, what we have here, if you think about the numbers that we work with in our daily life, uh, usually we can think of, about them as being on a number line. I'm gonna start this number line right here and call that zero. And you can think about the number line as extending all the way to the right, and we might say that we can count all the way to infinity if we wanted to. We could count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. A million, one, a million, two, a million, three, a billion, one, a billion, two, and so forth. Um, there's nothing really exciting about this other than to say that mathematicians classify the numbers into different categories. Um, the numbers that we call the natural numbers start with not zero, but one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? 
So that process continues. I'm not going to go ahead and populate this number line with more stuff than I need to. Uh, but the natural numbers are named such, I'm going to put this here, natural, the naturals. They're named the natural numbers because they're the numbers that you naturally learn when you're an infant or a child. Um, you start counting objects, physical objects like blocks, or maybe you start counting like chickens or eggs or something like that. And you can think of like a basic uh, primitive society, you know, before civilization needed to have some number system for keeping track of the number of livestock they had, number of goats, the number of uh, bushels of hay or something like that. Um, and you would start counting with one thing, two things, three things. But as societies developed, we needed to expand that number system to include the number zero, uh, a concept which really you could think about it if we're counting objects or an amount of some substance that we have. Uh, zero is like having nothing. Now, I don't want you to confuse this idea of zero and nothing because they're not exactly the same. Zero is a number, it is something. And so we don't wanna sort of ignore it and confuse it with, with the concept of nothing. Um, but this comes in handy here because you could have one chicken and then you might uh, eat that chicken and then go back to zero, right? Um, when it comes to more complicated things, like let's say I owed my brother three chickens, then I would need to expand my number system further so that I can include things like negative numbers. So I might go ahead and say, let's go ahead and invent new numbers. And those numbers are gonna to go to the left of all of the positive numbers. And uh, we'll sort of make it symmetric to the positive side, but we'll just call this negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and so on. And we can count backwards into the negative values all the way to negative infinity if we wanted. So this is where our negative numbers live. Zero is sort of a special number in this regard because zero is not considered negative nor positive. But all of these numbers combined, we would call integers. So, uh, was that a question? So the integers you can think of as all of the whole numbers, the positives, the negatives, and zero, they're all considered integers. And I'm gonna keep coming back throughout the semester to talk about this idea of expanding our, our concept of our number line, because we might need to, to think about other kinds of numbers. Uh, again, this lecture today is about fractions. So you can imagine that we need to somehow be able to take whole numbers and break them apart into smaller pieces. So what I like to do is talk about, um, I like to talk about pizza. Okay. So let's think about a pizza party. If I have a pizza, how many slices are usually in a pizza? Eight. Yeah, it's usually yeah, eight. It's eight or usually six. Cut up into eight traditionally. They cut the pizza in half. They cut it in half again. So now I have four pieces. We can cut those halves into half and then those halves into half. So now I have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight pieces. So I have one whole pizza and that's equal to eight slices. So what you might say is that if I'm talking about a single slice, like this, like this slice here, this slice is worth the fraction one over eight or one eighth of the pizza. So when we're talking about fractions, fractions are really a way to discuss parts of a whole. And you could think about how useful this might be to, to do for anything, right? If you're trying to share 
some amount of supplies with your family or community. And you would have to divide up those, whatever those supplies are. In this case, we're talking about pizza so that you can give a piece of the whole to everybody, right? So like, let's say that we baked a, a pizza ourselves and we had 12 people in our household. Well, if we wanted to give them each an even slice, we would cut the pizza into 12 equal slices. Um, so how would we do that? There's probably a couple of ways we could do that. Yeah. Uh, I won't bore you with those details, but the top number of a fraction we understand is called the numerator. And the bottom number of the fraction is called the denominator. If only I could spell. The numerator represents the amount of smaller pieces that you have. So in this case, this one slice is just one part of the whole. But the whole pizza was cut into eight total slices. So the denominator is related to the total number of slices, the total number of pieces. And the numerator is related to the number of pieces we have. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, now when we talk about fractions, we might want to talk about equivalent fractions because some fractions, even though they look different, they have the same value. So let's talk briefly about equivalent fractions. So let's say that um, I had a pizza and it's a traditional pizza and we cut it in the conventional way, we have eight equal slices. And yet my friend um, has a pizza and they decided to cut that pizza into, maybe they wanted to cut it into six slices. So. Maybe they cut that into two, and then they cut each of those into three equal slices. Something like this. Well, as we said before, one of the slices of my pizza rep is represented by what fraction? One eighth. Yeah, this is gonna be one eighth of the whole pizza. And one slice of my friend's pizza Represent is represented by what fraction? One sixth. Yeah, one sixth. So if my friend uh, said, um, give me two slices of your pizza and I'll give you one, would that be an even trade? Yeah. Well, let's think about that for a second. Oh, it wouldn't be because your, oh. your slice is smaller than his. So let's think about that, right? If I gave them two slices, that would be this corner back here, right? So we could call that two eighths if we wanted to. It would be a little bigger. And we're trying to compare two eighths and I'm gonna put a little square here. We don't know which one's bigger and one six. It sort of looks like this two eighths is bigger than this one sixth because it looks like this is about a fourth of the pizza, right? Or a quarter of the pizza, you might say. But this doesn't look like it's, it's big enough because we probably would want to cut this slice into two and then take a portion of that, right? Um, so we need to think about, well, let's think about this first fraction here, the amount that we're offering up. Uh, we could reduce this fraction if we wanted to, uh, because it, instead of calling it two over eight, uh, we could probably divide this uh, two over eight, divide both the top and the bottom by two, and we would get one over four. So it turns out that two eighths is the same thing as one fourth or one quarter. 
Uh, we couldn't reduce this fraction over here uh, because it's fully reduced, uh, but we still want to sort of compare which one of these is bigger. Um, well, we would have to get some sort of common denominator in order to make that comparison. But I feel like I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. You can see how, um, you know, if I'm talking about my pizza here, that the fraction 2 eighths, so I'm going to go over here and then cut this into eighths again. That if I take two slices of this pizza that's been cut into eight, that that is equal to or equivalent to if I had just taken a pizza and cut it into four slices and then taken one fourth of that pizza. So this is one eighth, this is another eighth. You can put that together and call that two eighths. And that's the same as just taking one fourth. So these are equivalent fractions. So even though they have different numbers in them, two eighths doesn't look like one fourth. Uh, they are the same value. They are the same amount of stuff. Okay. And we'll get back to this question of trading pizzas a little bit later on. Does anybody have any questions about this? Where did you get the two uh, to do the division? Right here, you mean? Yeah, where did you get that two from? Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. So just be patient with me. So where did I get the two from? In order to sort of understand that a little bit better, uh, what we need to understand is this, some more vocabulary. Uh, we need to talk about prime numbers. Okay, so what is a prime number? Well, before we can talk about prime numbers and composite numbers, we need to talk about something called factors. Okay, so this is just a definition. Um, factors are numbers that multiply together to make another number. So as an example, you can think about uh, two times three is equal to six. That's a really simple uh, little equation. Here, two and th uh, three are called the factors of six because they multiply to make the six. We call the result of the multiplication the product. So if you multiply two or more numbers, the result will be called the product, okay? So why do we need to understand that to understand prime numbers? Well, prime numbers is a number whose only factors are the number one and itself. So in other words, you can only break this number down into one and itself. So some examples of some prime numbers would be like two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17. I'm sort of going through my head in my, my memory bank for my list of primes. Okay, so these numbers are numbers that cannot be divided evenly to get two whole numbers that multiply to make them, right? Because two can only be broken down into two times one. 
uh, three can only be broken down into three, uh, three times one. Same thing with five, that's only five times one. And so that's how we sort of know that these are prime numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah. All other numbers that can be broken down into more than one factor pair are called composite numbers. So numbers having more than one factor pair. So for example, um, we could talk about the factors for the number 18. And I, I usually think about the factor pairs as being part of this T chart where I'm thinking about a group of numbers that multiply to make 18. So the easiest uh, you know, factors of 18 to think about are one times 18, but there's also uh, two times nine and three times six. Four doesn't go into 18, five doesn't go into 18, and then we're back at six. So you can see here but from this example that 18 has one, two, three factor pairs. So we have three factor pairs. And so this has to be a composite number. So why would we make the detour to talk about prime and composite numbers? Well, this is related to uh, the question that was asked about where did I get that two from when I was trying to reduce that fraction uh, from before? What we can do is a process called prime factorization to prime factorize the numerator and the denominator of a fraction and then cancel out common factors using division, okay? So let me give you guys an example of that. So we wanna write, you might have instructions in your homework that say something like write the given fraction in lowest terms. Okay. Now, whenever you see lowest terms, that's the same thing as saying that you want to reduce the fraction. And, and that's really a misnomer because you're not really reducing anything. You're really just reducing what the fraction looks like. The value is going to remain the same. Um, but one example of this would be like, let's take a look at the fraction 10 over uh, 85. So the process of prime factorization is going to help us reduce this fraction. And basically, we'll, we'll think about using this technique that I like to call a prime factorization tree. Is this basically simplifying the fraction? Yeah, that's another word for it, simplifying okay. the fraction. In fact, that's probably a better, uh, better name for the process to simplify the fraction but you'll see it written or, or hear it spoken about in these different ways, reduce the fraction to lowest terms, simplify the fraction, right? So right now, if you look at this fraction, 10 is sort of a big number and 85 is sort of a big number. And when I say big, it, I, it's sort of a relative thing, but we, we wanna think about simplifying this fraction or writing it using smaller numbers, but we don't wanna compromise the value. We don't wanna change the value of this number. So what we'll do in prime factorization is we'll take a look at the numerator. In this case, it's 10. And we'll think about breaking this down, not using a t-chart, but using a, a factor tree. So what I like to do is think about two numbers that can multiply to make 10. Has anybody got two numbers that multiply to make 10? Five from mm -hmm. two and five. Two and five, right? Now, what we would do in this process is continue breaking down all of the branches of this tree until we can no longer break down any of these numbers. 
And what I mean by that is we break them down until we get prime numbers. Well, we've already broken 10 down. 10 is the same thing as two times five. Now, if we tried to break down two, uh, based on that last sheet of paper that we went over, um, two is a prime number. So what I would do is circle all of your prime numbers. Two can't be broken down into anything other than two and, and one, so two times one. Uh, the same thing goes for five. Five is a prime number. And when all of the branches have been broken down into their primes, well, then you're done breaking down that number. We have fully factorized 10. 10 can only be written as two times five. Uh, we'll also do the same thing with the denominator, 85. Now, can anybody think about two numbers, uh, or can anybody give me two numbers that will multiply to make 85? And it's okay, it's okay if you can't think of it off the top of your head, right? You might look at this number and say, five goes into it. So five will go into it for sure. And then you might want to grab your calculator or do some, you know, some scratch work and work that division out because that's essentially what we're doing. Multiplication and division are two sides of the same coin. There's five and 17. Yeah, five and 17. And if you didn't know that off the top of your head, you could do 85 divided by five. Mm -hmm. Right. So 17 times five, we could check that in our calculator, gives us 85. And it turns out that these are both prime numbers as well. So we have fully broken down uh, our numerator and denominator into its prime factors. And do we have a question? Okay. So once we've done the prime factorization part, what we're going to do is rewrite the fraction. So I'm gonna write a line here. That's my fraction bar. I'm gonna write my numerator. Instead of writing 10 on the top, I'm gonna to write two times five. And on the bottom of this fraction, I'm going to write uh, five times 17. Well, when I introduced fractions, I said that fractions are fundamentally related to division. In the same way that we were taking a pizza, and then dividing it up into smaller slices. So for the numbers that occur on the top of the fraction bar in the numerator, those prime factors that we found, they're related to the denominator by the relationship of division. So if you have a number on the top, it doesn't matter what order, but if you have a number on top, a factor on top, that's the same as the factor on the bottom, those numbers will cancel out because any number divided by itself is one. So what I can say is that since I have a five here and I have a five on the bottom, the division, the fraction is sort of like a division bar, right? Five divided by five is one. So I can say that those cancel out. We can cancel common factors. So all that will be left is two over 17. And since we've already identified that we have fully factorized both of these numbers, the numerator and denominator, and we've canceled out whatever we could, all that's left over is the two and 17. Since they don't have any additional common factors to cancel out, that must be it. We must be done. Our fraction is fully simplified. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, so this, this prime factorization process might seem really long-winded. Uh, you can actually, with enough practice, speed up that process. And this might not be the way that you learned how to reduce fractions in the past or simplify fractions. In, in that previous example, I just out of nowhere, you know, divided my numerator and denominator by two. Well, in this case, if we had 10 over 85, and if for some reason you knew that there is a, five, a factor of five in the numerator and a factor of five in the denominator, then you might say, let's divide this by five and divide out the five on the bottom. And that will give you the two 
over the 17. And this is the traditional way that simplifying fractions is taught. But the way, the reason that I'm introducing prime factorization is because that process is going to come up time and time again throughout this course. Even when we see more complicated uh, expressions that have variables and numbers, we're gonna be relying on prime factorization. So you need to be practicing that process when you're reducing fractions, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is give you guys a set of examples of fractions to reduce. And I'm gonna throw you into breakout rooms with, uh, I'm not sure how many of this there are. It looks like we have a full class. So I'll break us into three breakout rooms and I want you to work on the problems on your own, reducing the fractions and then work together to discuss you know, any issues that you run into. So let me go ahead and uh, write the problems down. So practice problems. Twenty four over twenty six, one hundred and forty over two sixty, seventy seven over fifty five. Okay, so take a moment to write those down. I'm going to go ahead and throw you guys into breakout rooms. And once you've written these down, you can begin work on working on them, but accept this uh, invitation to the breakout rooms. Um, I'm going to assign automatically. So this should randomly create the rooms. And you should get an invitation now. I forget that uh, when I come back from the breakout rooms that I'm automatically muted. So if that ever happens and I'm just like talking, just unmute yourself and yell at me. Okay, so I'm gonna roll through these really quickly. I think that we had enough time to work on them for the most part. Um, when you get really comfortable doing this prime factorization, you'll be able to sort of do some scratch work to the side and then come back over here to do your clean work. That's usually how I break up my workspace. So I might put you know, a line in the middle of the paper or maybe two thirds of the way on this side of the paper. And then I'll say, I'm gonna keep all of my scratch work over here. Now it's really important that your scratch work is off to the side so that it doesn't confuse you later on when you go to read it. Uh, we need to prime factorize, uh, factorize the number 24 and also 26. So I know that 24 can be written as, um, two times 12, because that's just what's popping out in my head. You might have chosen other numbers uh, that multiply to make 24, and that's perfectly fine. Um, two is a prime number, so I'll circle it. But then we can break down 12 into two and six, where two is prime again, and six can be broken down into two and three. So two is prime and three is prime, so that completes that factor tree. 26 can be broken down into 2 and 13, and both of those are prime. So I'm done with my factor trees. I'm going to go over here and rewrite my fraction as the numerator was 24. So I'm going to take the prime factors 2 times 2 times 2. That takes care of these 2s, and then times 3. That is the same thing as 24. And if you didn't believe me, you could throw it into the calculator. 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. And sure enough, it is 24. It's not magic. Um, then 2 times 13 goes on the bottom. Well, since I only have one common factor, uh, this 2 will cancel out this 2. But once that's canceled out, that's all I have left over. So we'll just go ahead and multiply these numbers back together. Two times two is four, and then four times three will give us 12. So we have 12 here over 13, 
and that is going to be our fully reduced fraction. Does anybody have any questions about that one? We can do the same thing with 140 and 260. Uh, this is looking a lot like 2 times 70 to me, where that is prime. This is 2 and 35. This is 5 and 7, and that completes our factor tree for 140. 260 looks a lot like 26 with an extra 10 in there, so I might say that this is 10 and 26. This is 2 and 5, and these are prime. And we said this is 2 and 13. So the numerator here was 2 times 2 times 5 times 7. So 2 times 2 times 5 times 7. All over, we have 2 times 2 times 5 times 13. And I'm just sort of a stickler, so I like to put them in numerical order. Uh, but the order doesn't really matter here. I just think it looks a lot cleaner. I'm going to identify the common factors. So I, this two will cancel this one on the bottom. This two will cancel this two on the bottom. This five will cancel this five on the bottom. And so 140 over 20, uh, 260 has to be 7 over 13. You guys OK with that? Uh, now, if you see a number like this, again, you don't have to necessarily use the prime factorization if it takes too long. And if you can readily identify that this is going to be 7 over 5, you might say to yourself, well, I know that 11 goes into both of those. So let me just think about this as dividing 11 out of the top and the bottom, because there's a factor of 11 at the top and the bottom. So that means 77 divided by 11 is 7, 55 divided by 11 is 5. These are both prime numbers, so they're not going to divide each other. Uh, so that is, that is the end of that one. So that one, we didn't use prime factorization. I have a question. The one, number three, it wouldn't be one since this, or is it because the uh, numerator is bigger than the denominator? Uh, for number three? Yeah, it wouldn't be one by itself. Number three, 77 over 55. Oh, okay. Um, you know how you have seven fifths? It wouldn't just be one by itself? No. Because like improper fractions, that's what she's yeah. saying. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So this is what's called an improper fraction, right? Because, right. because the numerator is bigger. Is bigger. I'm going to use this greater than the denominator. Uh, improper fractions are perfectly fine in our class. We don't have to convert them into anything else. But that does bring us to our next topic, right? I need to talk about uh, a topic that you might have learned about in grade school, or if you are into culinary arts or just like cooking and baking, you might run into recipes that say, you know, add one and a third cup or one and two, uh, three fourths of a cup of flour to your recipe, right? Those are what we call mixed numbers, where you have a fraction that's mixed with a whole number. And we can convert improper fractions like this one into mixed numbers. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Good segue. So the improper fraction, it's really just a terrible name for these things because they're perfectly fine. They're gonna be perfectly legal in this class. Unless I ask you specifically to reduce something into a mixed number, simplifying to an improper fraction that's fully reduced uh, is going to be good enough. You don't have to go the extra mile, but you will see some homework problems in the next two homework sets that have, they might ask you for write the answer as a mixed number. Uh, so we can convert our improper fraction to what's called a mixed number. Fractions are all related to division, and that's what we're going to use to sort of figure out what the mixed number is supposed to be. So we had 7 over 5, right, for our last example. And the process for converting a, an improper fraction to a mixed number 
is to say, um, if we had seven divided by five, uh, how many times does five go into seven? It can go. One. That what? One. Oh yeah. Yeah, it goes in one whole time. But what would be left over, right? We would still have some sort of remainder. We'd have two. We'd have two left over. So what we have to do to write this as a mixed number is say that five goes into seven one whole time with two left over, but we were originally dividing by five, so we need to keep that denominator. So it turns out that seven fifths is the same thing as one and two fifths. That is five goes into seven one whole time with two remainders left. So this part is the whole number part. This is our remainder. And this is going to be the original denominator, or we could call it the original divisor. And if you needed to see that in long division form, right, we would say seven divided by five. So I like to say that the number on top, the numerator, we can call it the cowboy. And the number on bottom is the horse. The cowboy rides the horse. The cowboy sleeps inside of the house and the horse sleeps outside. You might seem like, or you might think that that's sort of a juvenile way of explaining this, but I guarantee you it's gonna help some of you out, remember, because a lot of times students will flip the division here. So you need to remember what goes inside of this division box. The cowboy uh, rides on top of the horse, the cowboy sleeps inside, okay? So five goes into seven one time. And we say one times five is five. And then we subtract that and we have a remainder of two. So this is the whole number part. And that's our remainder. I'll give you guys a moment to sort of digest that and write it down. Okay. So let's, let's practice this a little bit. Um, I think that in the interest of time, I won't throw you guys into breakout rooms, but let me write down a few problems for you and see if you can convert some improper fractions to mixed numbers. So convert improper fractions. to mixed numbers. Forty four over three. Thirty seven over six. And fifty nine over twelve. So I'll give you guys about five minutes or so to do that.
take a look at these problems. So yeah, if, if I was looking at this problem for number one, I would just say, uh, let's take 44 and divide that by three. Four goes into, I'm sorry, three goes into four one time as three, then we can subtract that. We get one, we're gonna drop the four. Four goes into four, I'm sorry, three goes into 14, how many times? Four would be 12. Four. Yeah, so four, 12, we'd have two left over. And we're gonna stop with our remainder. So we can say that for this process, we should have 14 as our whole number. And then we'll have a remainder of two over three. And you'll notice that when we do this process, this fraction over here should be fully reduced. So 14 and two thirds is our final answer for that one. Any so questions? If, it, if it was improper, then it wouldn't be fully reduced is what you're saying? Yeah, if, if you get an improper fraction over here, again, because the whole process is supposed to take an improper fraction and spit out a fully reduced mixed number. If it's still improper over here, you didn't do the division correctly. You'll want to oh. start, start at the top. Okay. Thank like you. that, then that number probably goes into 44 more times. Gotcha. Yeah. So we can do the same thing for this next one and say, cowboy sleeps inside the house. How many times does six go into three? It does not. So how many times does six go into 37? Well, I know six times six is going to be 36. So I'll have a remainder of one there. So our whole number is six we have a remainder of one and the original denominator was six. So six and one sixth should be what we got for number two. And then finally, uh, 59 divided by 12. 12 doesn't go into five, so I'll put a zero there. 12, how many times does it go into 59? I know that 12 times five should be 60. Uh, that's just something I have memorized in my head. Four times. It's four. So it has to be four. And 12 times four is gonna be 48. So when I do that subtraction, nine minus eight is one. One, so I have 11 left over. Mm -hmm. that, that's fine uh, because we'll see that our whole number is four. We have four whole pizzas. Uh, and we have a remainder of 11 where the pizza was cut up into 12 slices. This is a fully reduced fraction. This is a perfectly fine um, mixed number. You, you, you say it like they, it can get reduced further. Is that possible? Uh, not for this one because oh, okay. 11 is prime. Like we did the division correctly. If okay. I had if I had said twelve goes into this five times, I would have gone too much over. Okay. No. Yeah. No. I, it's just the way you were saying it was like no, it's fine, but like I got it like as if we can go even further. No, no. I, I meant like oh, it's perfectly fine. Like you don't have to worry <laughs> about it. Like gotcha. if you have if you completed the process and you've done it the way I've taught you, even if it looks weird, like to me, eleven over twelve looks a little bit weird because the numbers are still kind of big. Yes. Uh. But if you've done the process correctly and you've made no mistakes, then you just need to trust the process. Yes, sir. Thank don't, you, sir. don't overthink it is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's a perfectly respectable and fine fraction. Okay. Thank you, sir. You got it. Okay. So now we want to give you guys a process for going in the opposite direction. That is converting from a mixed number to an improper fraction, because you're going to run into problems like that too where you have to maybe add or subtract, multiply or divide a mixed number and an improper fraction. And we wanna have it all as uh, not mixed numbers. We really don't wanna deal with mixed numbers, we wanna deal with fractions. So a lot of the times what I'll do is take a mixed number and convert it back to an improper fraction. Well, the way we're gonna do that, we're gonna take our mixed number and convert it back to an improper fraction. Again, it's, it's a poor name, for this, what we're calling improper fractions. They're not improper, they are fine. Uh, I like them better than mixed numbers. Just sort of the lies that we tell children that we teach in grade school. Um, so let's start off with, with an example here. 
um, let's say I had the mixed number four and three fourths. Well, if I sort of revisit the, the process in the other direction, right? When we were converting um, improper fractions to mixed numbers, we had to use division somehow. And when we did that long division, right? You say, how many times does five go into seven? So seven divided by five. And then in that process, we're also using subtraction. So if we're reversing this process and the process uses division and subtraction, you can imagine that if we're going in the opposite direction, taking a mixed number and changing it to an improper fraction, that we'll have to use the opposite operations, multiplication and addition. And that's exactly right. The process for converting a mixed number to an improper fraction is that we are going to take the denominator and multiply by the whole number part. We're gonna take the result of that multiplication. We're gonna take that product, whatever the product is, and add it to whatever is the numerator on the fraction part. So what I can say is that we're gonna take four times four and then add it to whatever the original numerator was and that will remain over our original denominator. So original denominator. Okay. So four times four is 16. 16 plus three on top over four. And that's just 19 over four. And that is the improper fraction form of four and three fourths. I'll show you another example. Uh, maybe we're gonna do five and seven eighths. And we wanna convert that. So again, I like to draw these little arrows where I say I'm gonna multiply the bottom and whatever I get from that multiplication, I'm then going to add it to whatever's on top. So I say eight times five is 40 plus the seven that I had originally up there and it's all over the original denominator. So this should be 47 over eight. Again, you wanna be very uh, clear about what the directions are asking you. If they say convert the mixed number to an improper fraction, once you have your improper fraction, you are done. That is where you stop. Do not look at the improper fraction and think that there is something wrong and that we have to convert it back to a mixed number because then we're defeating the purpose of the problem, right? We're undoing the work that we just did. So when I say read the instructions, I mean really read the instructions and follow exactly what they say. Stop where they say to stop, okay? Don't trick yourself into thinking that you have to do more work. So with the remaining time, let's go ahead and give you guys some examples of this, uh, uh, of to, some practice problems, I mean. So we're going from mixed numbers to improper fractions. And I'm going to give you 10 and three sevenths, seven and three sevenths, and 15 and seven tenths. Again, in the interest of time, we won't go into breakout rooms. So just take a moment to convert those into improper fractions.
And then once you're done with, with these problems, you can go ahead and throw your thumbs up just to let me know that you're done. Oh, cool. Dang, you guys are fast. Or maybe this is really simple stuff for, for some of you guys, and that's okay too. Um, yeah. If the stuff at the beginning of the semester, these first few lectures, is goes a little bit slow, uh, just respect the process. Hopefully, you'll be able to pick up some, some way of understanding these numbers uh, that you didn't know before. You know, it might be a very subtle thing, but it'll be super helpful for later on. Uh, because if the beginning of the semester seems like it's going slow, I guarantee you that there are going to be times where it feels like it's going really fast. So just respect the process. I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. Does anybody have any questions? Can anybody tell me what they got for number one? I received 73 over seven. Yeah, that's great. So we're gonna multiply seven times 10 is 70 plus three. And that's gonna be 73 over seven. Again, it's fully simplified. We don't have to worry about simplifying. We're good there. Uh, what about uh, somebody other than Michael? Uh, what did you guys get for number two? I got 52 over seven. 52 over seven. So 70, uh, sorry, 49 plus three. 52 over seven, looking good guys. All right, and then for the last one. 157 uh, over 10. 157 over 10, too cool. Okay, well, I think that that is all uh, that we have time for. Um, you know, we covered, you know, the, the definition of fractions, how to convert between improper fractions and um, mixed numbers, how to reduce fractions using prime factorization. Again, in the past, I've had students say, well, I don't really like prime factorization. I'm going to do it my own way. And that's fine. It'll get the job done. But prime factorization is going to come up later in the semester for more complicated things. And that is going to be the primary way that we're going to solve those more complicated problems. So if you're not comfortable with prime factorization, Practice that process until you're comfortable with it. Um, tomorrow, what we're going to do is continue working on fractions. Uh, we have not covered all of the fraction material, so you may get into the homework and look at the first homework on fractions and see what you can do. But I will let you know when we've covered all the material that's needed so that you can complete that homework in, it, in its entirety. Tomorrow, we will cover uh, fraction arithmetic, that is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with fractions. Um, so if you guys have any questions and want to hang back and just chat with me for a bit, uh, if you had trouble with the orientation or have any questions about the Canvas course, just chill out. But otherwise, you guys are free to go for the afternoon. I'll see you guys tomorrow, same time, same place. I had a question. Okay. So um, being that I, I just started the class today, so... Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of like lost to where do I go for the homework in the my lab? Is yeah, yeah. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to stop recording. Um, okay.